so usually like Joe DeSena walks around and we'll be eating pizza and talk to us and be like, you want to quit? We got, we got some pizza for you. And I mean, that, that happens like constantly, but he'll constantly like towards the end of the race, like, you know, some of the races I've been in when it's like 50 hours, he's like, there's not enough people quit. We got to go on for four days. Hey everybody, this is Rick Alexander, one of your more regular hosts here at Lionheart Radio. I wanted to thank everybody for listening and supporting the show, and I also wanted to tell you that everyone behind the scenes at Lionheart Radio has pulled together our resources, and we've created a free ebook that you can download on our website, and it's meant to break down the barriers between you and a healthy lifestyle. Now, heading into summer, I know that getting shredded is on the forefront of everybody's mind. If you look at Men's Health Magazine or Women's Health or whatever, you're going to see a six-week to summer shred some bullshit article about a 15-minute ab routine or some other shit that isn't going to give you the secret to being healthy all year round. There's proven methods that work, and we've included all of these in this ebook. And we're going to give it to you for free because the things that you need to know to be healthy aren't complicated. We're going to break down fad diets. We're going to break down how to count macros and even give you some exercise suggestions. Again, the ebook is free, so head to www.lionheartrad.io and download your free copy. And now, on to the show. Welcome back to Lionheart Radio. I'm your host, Rick Alexander, founder of Louis Vive in San Diego, California. And today, I am joined by multiple death race finisher, author of all things Ella, and public speaker now, uh, Ella Kosiba. So thank you for uh, being on. Thank you for having me. So the listeners don't know, so I guess I'll just out myself. This is our second interview because I screwed the first one up. <laughs> Way to go. <laughs> um, so if you could, though, for the audience that doesn't know you or, or might just be finding you, could you maybe go through your story as it relates to fitness? Because I know you've had a lot of ups and downs from the beginning. Yeah, for sure. So I started racing horses when I was 12 years old. I competed in um, – races that ranged anywhere from 25 to 55 miles. Um, I was so dedicated it and, and I loved it. I ended up having an accident. So I stopped being an athlete for probably about two, two, three years. And then I just started running because that's all I was cleared to do. So I was just running and running and I actually hated to run. I hated it a lot. Like my mom forced me to join cross country and I mainly did it because my older brothers and sisters were just beast of athletes. And so I started running. Sure enough, I started becoming a good runner and then running got boring. So I was like, all right, I'm going to start lifting. So when I graduated high school, that's just all I did. I was waking up at five in the morning, just lifting for hours and going for runs. I was racking up serious miles and I just started entering into all these like 5Ks, half marathons, and I just started doing really well. Sure enough, the running was boring. So then I entered into uh, my first ever obstacle race in 2011 and I ended up winning it and then I two weeks later I signed up and did a Spartan race won that as well and so I was just kind of like oh maybe I found something that I'm good at and during this time in 2000 early 2012 I did a bodybuilding show just for shits and giggles definitely found out it wasn't my cup of tea um, but it was cool to do it and to, I met some cool contacts and so after that, I just kept like scaling up and doing all these obstacle races. And I got picked up some, by some big sponsors in um, 2012. And I mean, every other month I was somewhere West Coast, East Coast, wherever. And I was doing a lot of Spartan races mainly. And then, of course, when you kind of get into that little like adventure obstacle world, you start finding out new things. So then the yeah. death race became one of my best friends. And even though it was just... It, it honestly is just a terrible race, and, and I wouldn't even call it a race. It's like an event, um, but this event really, like, changes a lot of lives, and it definitely changed mine. So I did my first death race. Like, I had never done a ruck. I had never had 50 pounds on my back for more than, like, a mile, and here I was, just signed up to do this death race, and it crushed my soul, but I loved it. <laughs> so I was like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look more into all these, like, multi-day events because... It was something beautiful that happened to the mind to me. It was just like, wow, it's it's more than just like running and seeing who's the strongest or leanest. It was like once you had that sleep depriving, it was a whole another ball game. So I started entering into races that were 30 hours, 12 hours. And then that just started being like my, definitely my cup of coffee. So I just started doing that a lot. And um, yeah, I just continued to race. I kind of had to walk away from racing in 2000, 
14, but did a few races in 2015. Yeah. Okay. So I definitely, that's a lot to unpack. So we'll start from the, <laughs> yeah, <sorry. laughs> yeah, no, we'll start from the beginning. So the first thing that caught my attention is you said you horse raced, you were doing mm -hmm. 50 mile horse races at 12 years old. Is that normal? I mean, I wouldn't say like what is normal, but I was lucky enough to grow up with a mom and dad who had horses. So luckily that was just right at reach. And my mom was always racing horses and it was always a family thing to go camping with the horses. And I just really fell in love. And so I started joining my mom in these races. And honestly, like I would come home as a sixth grader. And I remember just riding my horse in the dark. Like that's all I did. I rode my horse every day. I loved it. And um, me and my, I've had a couple horses, um, but I've competed really well. Placed top 10, um, best condition. Um, that used to be a huge goal of mine was to be a professional equestrian. Um, but the horse sport, it, like the question world is very expensive. Yeah. Um, it was very hard to hit sponsors in that field. Um, but I really enjoyed the sport. Uh, I still competed until I was about a little after I graduated high school. I still own my horse now. I haven't raced, um, in an endurance race and probably, oh man, it's sad to say maybe five years. Okay. But yeah. So let me ask you this. Were you racing against other 12 year olds? No, I was always the youngest. Okay. Um, yeah, most of the time, even when I competed in my other events, I've always been the youngest athlete, but now not so much since I've gotten older. But yeah, as a l young little girl racing those horses, I generally never saw anyone my age. Um, yeah. So I don't want to make, <laughs> I don't want to make the interview about the horses, but I'm just curious <laughs> when it comes to training endurance uh, for, for horses, how focused are you like on their nutrition and on their training and stuff like that? Do you periodize it like you do with humans or do you know? Yeah, believe it or not, that's kind of how I learned how to train is um, I had like designated long days on the horse and then shorter workouts. So <laughs> where I grew up was really kind of beautiful and cool. So back behind my house was about 300 or so acres. That was basically ours. And I had a couple trails that I had like marked. <clears throat> so some days I'd go out if me and my mom didn't trailer the horses I would do several loops as fast as I could, give the horse a break, or I would just go for a certain mileage, like anywhere from five to 25 miles in a training session. Now the feeding was very precise. We even made like um, electrolyte shots, basically. It's like applesauce and Pedialyte for the horse. Um, their feed is very on point because throughout the whole entire race and these races I did, we were constantly judged and vet checked. So if your horse was failing during a vet check, you'd be pulled. Because if you get a horse in that kind of environment, it'll run itself to death, basically. Mm -hmm. um, so throughout each each section of the race, so say you're doing a 25-mile race, um, you'll have a vet check before the race starts. You have to pass. You'll go out and do your first loop. Perhaps it's like 12 miles. And then you'll have another vet check. You have to pass that middle vet check in order to go on to the next loop. And then you do the next loop. And it's say you completed everything, but that final vet check you didn't pass, like your horse failed his vital signs, you're disqualified. So you weren't finished, even though you just did all 25 miles. Hmm. So that's... So they, yeah, I didn't mean to cut you off, but so they, they make that to where like your horse is conditioned, your horse is healthy to do this. So it also made um, training for these races a little bit more tedious because if you were placing top 10, you even went through more extensive vet checks and they checked your horse more, even judged the rider and weighed our equipment. So you were done, you went through this, like this process to see who was best condition overall. So that's actually not unlike a human, right? Cause uh, I overtrain myself all the, all the fucking time, right? Yeah. Like the hardest part of coaching somebody that's like really motivated is getting them to, to deload, right? And to rest. Yeah. How are you figuring out how these horses are recovering? I guess, how are you measuring recovery? basically by their mood now okay. i've had several horses um and it's just more so about getting to know your animal and like being in tune with them but if my horse was really sour to go out for a ride because he loved to work he loved to be an athlete now he's all fat though hmm. but when, it, when we were training he was a beast and if he was really snobby and like ran away from me um when i went to go get him that was a clear sign he was just burnt um, but obviously horses are horses, animals are animals. They're not always going to be like sure. accurate. It's, it's, it's a little harder to train an animal for something than you just oh, train yeah, yourself for sure. or something. Um, so also it's just paying attention to their body. Like sometimes you can see swelling in the back and um, if they're losing too much weight. But usually we I'd give them about a week rest after a race. They would rest for about 
three to four days and then you just take them out for a couple slow walks and then go back hmm. to training yeah yeah that's it's <laughs> interesting to draw the parallels there yeah it's hard it's just like you just trying to you know be familiar with the animal and the signs it gives right yeah so moving on when you got into the bodybuilding you mentioned that you didn't really enjoy that the being on stage part of it. <laughs> is that because it was so subjective slightly it was just like um, I also had a very difficult time during this bodybuilding show. I wasn't very healthy, but it was just more so like the environment it was in. A lot of women just spoke pretty poorly about their body. I felt very judgment. And then I just didn't like putting so much work in to stand on stage just, just to see how I looked. I've always been like a huge performer. And I just had a bad taste in my mouth because I had a really hard time even getting to the point where I could get on stage because I just I couldn't diet. And I still didn't even diet very well. Um, it just wasn't enjoyable for me, but it's a beautiful sport regardless, but it just wasn't for me. Yeah, so in your book, you outlined some things like some trouble with eating disorders and, and that kind of a thing. Where did that kind of come into play with your athletic journey? I think it kind of came from when I was a little girl. I kind of grew up very powerless in a powerful family. So I was always kind of lacking control on my body. So when I decided to be an athlete, like I really like clicked in my head. I was like, okay, I'm going to be great. And I know I can be an athlete. So I just like kept telling myself I'd be great. I'd be great. And so basically my desire to be great was also the same pathway of just being self-abusive and being such a perfectionist that I couldn't def like separate my reality versus, you know, what was really going on with me. So um, I, I don't even know if that just makes sense. But basically, I just wanted control of my body, and I wanted to be the best I could be, and I just read some misinformation online that said a woman was eating 800 calories, and I wanted to outdo that, so I started eating less and less, and before I knew it, I was just really addicted, and it also brought me success, so I, I didn't know, like I knew it was wrong, but I just couldn't give it up because it was a huge part of me, hmm. and that's what made um, my competing so hard, is I did every single thing I've done ever since I started competing professionally has been done unhealthy. I spent pretty much every night like throwing up or up all night, just like shaking. Um, I just never would allow any type of treats. And if I did, I'd go into binge cycles and a lot of shame and a lot of guilt. So eating was very difficult. Mm. When you say that you did get success from it, uh, do you mean on the stage or, or performance wise? Well, like, as I said, like my whole career was done just unhealthy. Like while I was competing, it just wasn't well. I, I lived a very harsh double life. Like mm. people looked towards me and loved me and I competed well. And I don't know how I competed so well. But when I was home, I just was binging and I was purging all the time. I mean, I would pull over on the side of the road and throw up on my way to work out. And then I'd go work out. And on my way home from work out, I'd pull over at a CVS and throw up in the parking lot. Like I was so addicted and so lost in it, but I was still winning races. I was still holding sponsorship titles and traveling the world. I couldn't let it go. Yeah. You know, like it, I just like it hurt and it was very dehumanizing the act of forcing yourself to throw up. But I also was so sh ashamed that people would view me as weak and because I used to think that was so weak and, it was crazy. As soon as I opened up about it, I, I eventually grew so much more strength and wisdom. But for the longest time, I was tricked into believing that it was shameful of me to even have some type of weakness like that. Hmm. Is that the main reason that you've stepped away from competing? Is it just extremely hard for you to have a healthy relationship with it? Yeah, it's, it's actually been a huge battle. Um, so I walked away from competing in 2014. I also had um, two companies who dropped me due to my bulimia, and that really hurt me. But I, I just tried to remain non bitter. But I knew I had to stop competing because, as much as I loved competing, it was also a huge trigger for me. So these weekends I'd go compete. Oh, I was so happy, but I was also just like a nightmare inside. So mm -hmm. I I was trying really hard to recover and to get over everything that was occurring in my head, and I couldn't do it if I still raced. And so. It was really hard, but I walked away 2014, and I kind of kind of lived off of the few money I still had and went and competed um, in 2015 and did the final death race then and did some few races, and it's been a little bit of a battle to figure out, like, how to eat and who I am, but 
I've never been happier than I am now. And, and I, I'm slowly getting ready to compete again, but it's, I've definitely wanted to take my time because I had to separate that old Ella from the new Ella. Cause she wasn't, she wasn't good. Mm. So I think from the outside, which, you know, social media and things like that aren't always the best indicator of how happy somebody is, uh, no. but, <laughs> but you seem very confident. Um, with yourself and your training in the direction of your life now. And oh, so by far. Yeah. So for people that maybe are in that similar relationship that have a unhealthy, you know, relationship with food or with competing, what what kind of advice do you have for them? Do you think that it's something where people need to step away and, and kind of reset? Because that's gonna be a hard battle, I think, to get people to do if they love it. It is. And trust me, like it's, it's almost even hard for me to this day to like go on Instagram and I'll see the people I used to compete with and they're still competing and they're still killing the game. And I will like, it hurts to look at that stuff online because I, I'm always like, well, what if I just never had stopped competing? I could still be, Oh, where would I be? I would be probably just making a huge name for myself, but sure. that kind of talk just doesn't do any good. And I am actually probably the healthiest and happiest I've been since 2000, since I was like 12 years old, hmm. you know, cause I, I broke my back then. And it's just been like this downward spiral of like trying to figure out how to deal with my pain. And I just never knew. And I finally feel very grounded in who I am. And that's only because throughout my whole time of my struggling, I just remained going forward and trying to be as present as possible. And it really hurts to realize like that you have to separate yourself from something you're loving, but sometimes you just have to, you have to not be the star of your life. You have to be the fly on the wall and be able to see everything that's going on because I wasn't, I wasn't there. I wasn't really there. I wasn't present in my life. So as soon as I was able to separate my voice from the, the demons in my head and really see like, wow, like I'm going nowhere, hmm. even though I love what I do. I also am so miserable. Um, yeah, so that sounds a lot like uh, mindfulness and meditation. I'm not sure how much you've experimented with with those. I don't like I don't like sit down and meditate. But one of the biggest things that people always ask me for advice, and honestly, the best thing that's helped me, and it's not gonna like help you instantly, but you might feel a little bit of like a spirit lifted. Is I just started going back to what really made me happy. Hmm. So when I when I quit racing and I I I, I didn't sign my co contract with like Reebok and all this, and I was like, wow, what am I gonna do? Like that's scary. I just started being like. Okay, before I ever got so sad, I used to be a happy little girl. I used to always, like, say, I'll bite you and, like, run around barefoot. <laughs> like, I was a crazy little kid. So I was like, what did I used to do? Oh, yeah, I used to always be outside. I used to always be hiking. I used to always stay up late drawing horses or whatever. So I started doing those things. I started doing the simple things that I remember doing as a kid when I was really innocent and just free. So, you know, I got a dog, Kalua, and she was like something that gave me purpose and really wanted to, I really wanted to be healthy for this dog. She made me so happy. So I started, you know, going out hiking with her and I started just feeling a little bit more better about myself. And then journaling has been a huge thing for me. One of my biggest advice, which is very hard to, to quote unquote master, but you're going to have to constantly reinforce it, is I used to always write down how I was feeling before and after a binge. So sometimes you can like tell yourself, okay, I'm about to binge. And sometimes that's powerful enough to make you stop. But most of the time it's not. Most of the time you can't even, you can't even vocalize it because Ed will steal your voice. But if you can start to like jot down things and it can even start as small as like hours later after something traumatic happens, you start writing down everything that happened, even like moments and days before that. And you'll start to figure out your own triggers and like, oh, I ate these like chocolates. And I guess that's a chocolate that really encourages me to binge. So it was just me like somehow figuring out to be mindful of my own body and my own mind and figuring out that I could disagree with what was going on in my head. Mm. That was, you know, and that's a, it, that's a constant thing. And I'm a naturally happy person, but you, I really have to choose that happiness. Cause if, if I have something bad go on in my day, like my head can easily attach to that sadness and it'll drag me down pretty instantly. So it's really about trying to like, just be calm and see where you're at and be present so you can make, uh, so you can emotionally position yourself right.
Yeah. We did a podcast with a guy named Fabio Zucchelli, who is a researcher in London, and he researches self-compassion versus self-esteem. And essentially, Um, yeah, especially as it relates to body image and fitness. And one of the really cool things that I took away from that interview, which is exactly what you're alluding to now, which is how being mindful allows you to get space between the emotional reaction and then what you really want to do. So when you get that emotional trigger, like you were talking about purging, it's like being mindful gives you some space to like sit back and analyze that and kind of be like, evaluate the decision better, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So what is the Spartan death rate? So uh, I think a lot of people listening to this don't understand it. It's pretty wild. So how would you describe it? (laughs) So this is kind of like a funny, dramatic comparison, but it's one of my favorites. The best way I usually describe the death race is it's like survivor and Saul combined. Okay. (laughs) So, I mean, I can give you some hard cold stats on it. Basically, usually there's only a 10 to 15% completion rate. There's no official start line. There's no official finish line. You have absolutely no task. You have no idea the task you're about to do until you do it. Um, Most of the time they play mind games to you. They'll lie to you. They'll take your clothes. They'll take your gear. They'll make you not talk for hours. You'll do 3,000 burpees. You'll stand in the water that's freezing for hours. You'll do yard work, stir a bucket full of rotten cow guts, carry a tree for miles. Like, it's just, it's not, like, that's why I say it's not a race. Mm. Because each individual kind of has a different journey. But it, it is one of the hardest events I've ever done. But it reminds me a lot of life because it's so unfair. So that's why I really got attached to it. It just was brutal in every way. So basically when you start, and I, and I don't know how true this is, and you can kind of tell me, they give you a list of things, required items, you may or may not use them. And it essentially ends when Joe DeSena, the founder, decides like enough people have quit. Is that true? Yeah, yeah. So usually like Joe DeSena walks around and we'll be eating pizza and talk to us and be like, you want to quit? We got, we got some pizza for you. And I mean, that, that happens like constantly, but He'll constantly, like, towards the end of the race, like, you know, some of the races I've been in when it's, like, 50 hours, he's like, there's not enough people to quit. We got to go on for four days. The longest it's gone on is four days, I think, and it was a winter death race. Um, but, yeah, you, you get a gear list, and most of the time you don't even use the gear that, you, that they tell you to bring. It's just for weight. Mm-hmm. So, like, sometimes we've had to bring, like, I had to bring a bag of hair one time. <laughs> it was really weird. A bag um, of hair? Any hair? Yeah, a bag of hair. Okay. Um, you could just bring anything? Dog hair, pubes, whatever they wanted? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, and, uh, and they didn't even do anything with them. It was just like they do a lot of like annoying, tedious tasks even before you actually get to the death race because right. all they're really trying to do is frustrate you. So that's why most of the time when the death race starts, you'll have anywhere from 8 to 24 hours of just doing manual labor. So most of the time we started the race where we were chopping wood or splitting logs or like picking, like pulling weeds out with our bare fingers, you know, and it's like bull needle or something. Building a, uh, a rock stairwell up the mountain because he owned all these mountains. So basically mm. we did all his labor work for like a day and then we'd start competing. Okay. <laughs> How do you train for something like that? You you really need to focus on your mind more than like the body. So basically, obviously, you do need to be in some type of good conditioning. Um, You need to be very familiar with hills. You need to be very familiar with weight on your back. So any type of kind of like military style training where you're rocking or really gaining strength in your back, especially, and then like running hills, all that type of stuff is very recommended. But it's more so about being very calm and like, aware of like how you're feeling because there's going to be a lot of times throughout the race where they just push you emotionally they'll push buttons on you and they'll really frustrate you and you'll be doing some tasks that's just like near impossible and if you have one little duck not in the line in your head you're done Mm. like they'll drop you, you you'll quit and people drop like flies in that race yeah so i would really say like being patient with your head and I used to do a lot of sleep depriving training, but like that's, you don't really have to, but you kind of want to know how you react with, you know, two days of no sleep or three days of no sleep. Mm-hmm. So I used to do some really extensive training and I, I would do this for like four days straight. Granted, this is when I didn't have like a job. I was just training. So this is kind of hard if you do have a job, but I would, um, every two hours during the night, I would have an alarm that would go off 
and when it would go off, I'd do like 50 push-ups, 50 squats, um, 50 crunches, just some kind of like, you know, little body weight workout. And then I would basically write down how I was feeling and then copy a paragraph down from some type of book. So I did this for a couple of days and I would basically note where I was breaking down mentally, physically, and like spiritually, all of that. So that way, I did this years ago, but I used to like, you know, see where I, where my head strength was at because that's really the only thing that really carried me through because yeah. your body will break down way before your mind does just the idea of getting up every two hours to work out would be like that probably shows you that you intrinsically have the mental toughness to do it <laughs> yeah. i don't think most people would even do that yeah yeah i mean i i was very upset several times and i was probably a major asshole during those days of when i would do that um, I think I was going to college at the time and I was taking like art classes and I used to sit in there and <laughs> I wish I was still friends with these people, but I would sit in this art class in college and I would wear like a 50 pound weight vest and I would just be drawing, suffering with my sleep depriving. That's, that's basically what I used to do. <laughs> yeah. So it sounds like you really had, you know, the intrinsic motivation and like you were, you were very headstrong out of the gate especially if you were 12 running or racing 50 miles on a horse. Do you think that that is something people can train or do you think that, I guess, do they have to have mental toughness in a, I'm always curious to what people's opinion on, on mental toughness is, whether it can be trained or you're only born with it. It's a hard line. I'd say like, I think you can, this is the way I see it. There's going to be whoops and there's going to be sheeps. There's followers and there's leaders. There, some people are going to be naturally able to tack into that part of our brain. Some people will never be able to do it because it takes so much self-awareness and so much tedious practice. It's literally an everyday chore to just be that aware of yourself and that like, like ready to take on whatever without getting emotionally involved and being able to let go of situations like goals, not controls. I think that can be taught but I don't think everyone will attain it. Hmm. Um, and I think it, I think the way I developed it was because I basically grew up very numb. Like when I was little, when I was 12, after I started racing the horses is when I, is when I broke my back. So I broke my back and I basically had a very static childhood life. I was in and out of wheelchairs, metal back braces, and I could barely walk. It was very difficult. And it, I mean, it happened at such a fragile time in my life when I was, um, I had the surgery when I was eighth grade. So I had, I had all this like weird stuff happening when I was in seventh and eighth grade, which is like one of the brutal times because kids are so mean during that time. Yeah, you don't so want to be mean. different at all. You do not want to be in a wheelchair with a pillow. Trust me, I was that <laughs> girl. People used to throw my pillow across the room. I uh. used to like, I had no reachability. So like, um, I remember like quote unquote friends would put the pillow like slightly in front of me and I couldn't reach to get it. Now I can remember all those Whoa. little things because at the time, like I didn't think too much about it, but that shit really affected me because I grew up in a very powerful family and I had no power. So I just grew up very numb. And that's why I always try to tell people to be very present, especially when like you're going through something very difficult and dark, because it'll teach you so much more than your success will. Because I grew up very dark for a long time, but I just remained being like, okay, like we'll just take this and we'll go. Because when you're 12 years old and you live in chronic pain and you're doing all this, like you don't really know much better. So I just thought this is how life was. And I didn't think too much of it, which kind of reinforced me to take emotion out of like my survival part of my brain. So I don't know. I always try to think that there's like three parts of how we function. There's like the emotional, conscious and survival. So I grew up in survival mode. I was mm. just doing what I had to do so I could walk right. or whatever. Right. Yeah. right. yeah. Little kids are dicks. They're so much worse now. Yeah. Little kids are dicks. <laughs> so well, I do um, a decent amount of like ultra endurance stuff. Yeah. And I find that having a really nailed down purpose, like your why they say, right, is uh, couldn't be the, the importance could not be understated. Um, do you think that those particularly difficult times while you were like kind of in the development phase of your life, do you think that those play into your why when you're doing these things like the death race? Like, do you think that, that contributed to your success? 
Yeah, a hundred percent. Um, everything like my dominoes led me to where I am now, even though some of those dominoes were rotten and kind of put me in some bad places. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be this mindful and this Ella now if I hadn't gone through what I did and growing up in such hard times really shaped me to be just more intuitive and like ready for more situations and just calm with life. So I'm really grateful for all of that. And it's really brought like a a very calmness when I race. Hmm. I'm not too like, I'm not too worried. I'm not too much in my head anymore. Now, obviously there's times where that's difficult and you can get like, wow, the shin splints hurts. So you're just thinking about, I really would much rather not run for three days or whatever. <laughs> sure. Know? But yeah, definitely growing up like that, definitely, definitely made my head calm to compete. Yeah. You're kind of actually a shining example of this, uh, I don't know if it's a theory, but this thing I've been kind of thinking about a lot lately, which is uh, negative reinforcement, like uh, having a chip on your shoulder, being mad at the world, whatever you, whatever that is, hate will get you to a place and it will get you to a place of success. Right. But it, there's a ceiling on where that'll get you. And it seems like at some point it has to be self-compassion. It has to be like love that will help you transcend that ceiling because your upward mobility, although hate can be a very powerful motivator, like you found, I think there comes a point where you, your upward mobility will be limited because hate's just not a powerful enough motivator to get you to that next level in most cases. Yeah, that was really beautifully put. I couldn't agree more with that because as soon as I started realizing like I wasn't going to go anywhere and that me hating myself so much was just I mean, I was going to die. So that's when I just try to start loving myself. But it took, you know, it takes you a long time when you don't know who you are, or how to love yourself. It took me, a, I mean, probably the beginning of this year to where I actually was like, okay, I love Ella Ann. And I'm going to just keep saying that. But that, that was really beautifully put. Yeah. And it's definitely much easier said than done for sure. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. I wish I had a secret to give, but honestly, La allow yourself to fail yeah and like, don't worry about it because i relapsed so many times with my bulimia and i would cut people off immediately when i did because i'm really terrified of disappointment that's the scary thing to me i think it's one of the most painful like loneliest pain you can experience i just hate being a disappointment that's probably my perfectionist speaking mm -hmm. but i mean allow yourself to make these mistakes Hey everybody, this edition of Lineheart Radio is brought to you by the world's first creatine coffee. Each scoop is a full cup of a Colombian Arabica bean coffee infused with five grams of a creatine monohydrate. Now here's the deal guys, a lot of people have differing opinions about creatine and unfortunately a lot of really shitty supplement companies have tried to sell it to kids that want to get big and they package it as some kind of steroid alternative and they tell you if you cycle it and if you stack it then you'll gain a bunch of muscle mass and at the end of the day none of that is true what is true is that it's one of the most studied and beneficial supplements on the market for strength recovery and endurance so whether you're a runner whether you are a strength athlete uh, or whether you're somebody that wants to enhance cognitive function and just feel healthier in everyday life, a pharmaceutical grade creatine monohydrate is going to help get you there. Go to www.creatinecoffee.com to learn what all the hype is about. And now on to the show. So before we get into kind of what you're doing currently with the speaking and, and what the future holds, I'm curious when you were training for these Spartan races or the adventure races, what training tools did you kind of utilize? And then also like supplementation at all? I was really like, obviously a lot of people know me from my, my legs and my lower half. I was, I was, ever since I had the surgery, my doctor was like, okay, you need to build legs. So I just became leg hungry. So I really focus on hamstrings, core, because these are things that supported my lower back. So with that type of training, it really involved me doing a lot of incline, a lot of squatting and for a while I had to work around like squats and I just did like body weight stuff and leg extension so I did a lot of leg work I really used a lot of prowler work I push sleds push stuff drag stuff hills you have to do hills <laughs> um, like pretty much every Spartan race you'll ever do and I mean the death races in Vermont are Mexico City so that's just volcano and Vermont mountains so it's you need to get familiar with incline and decline. So 
practice running hills, practice running down hills. And most of my training was usually pretty like cardiovascular. So most of the time it was supersets and in between each superset, it would be a quality rest. So it was quality of a quantity, but for the most part, I, I did do a lot of running, but here lately, like towards the end of my career, I stuck more to doing a lot of like intervals and just more um, weightlifting. So it's quality over quantity until you're working out all night long. <laughs> yeah, yeah, until until you're an idiot like me. <laughs> think you have to do the death race and do this extensive training. <laughs> yeah, well, the problem too is that a lot of people, like I, I kind of fall into this camp. I, I, lit- I literally enjoy the volume. Like I like the, I just like the meditation you get from it. Like I just like putting in miles. So that's kind of something you got to balance too when you're when you're training for these things. Yeah. And I used to, I used to be that way too. I used to love like my eight mile runs. Now I'm not in that condition anymore, but I used that. I used to get a lot of peace out of that. But as soon as like, I, I used to, I just easily overtrain. So, um, nowadays I only probably train three to four times a week, sometimes five, but rest days are a little bit more, more important for me now. Um, and my workout's a little bit more intense, but I rest harder. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and it's really improved just my passion with fitness. Cause when you're doing those serious miles and serious training, especially if you have a big endurance event, that doesn't mean you have to kill yourself. It doesn't mean you have to burn yourself out in training. Cause when race day comes, like just trust your training, trust the, trust the resting, the recovering you also did, because this all leads up to every single thing you're about to bonker through in the right. race. Yeah. Yeah, and that's actually really applicable to you right before the race. I find like sometimes I have this need where I'm like, "Fuck, I didn't do enough work. I got to get more volume in." No. And it's like, "Dude, you're not going to get fitter in the next 2 weeks. You're just no. you got to trust and what you've like, done." Yeah, and then like I used to always be anxious like I would try to rest 2 days before our event, and I couldn't do it. I'd always end up comp- like racing or not racing. I would always end up like running or doing some type of workout the day before. Hmm. And Perhaps if I hadn't done that, maybe I would have been in better like shape, like more rested, but you really have to just separate yourself from being like this all pain, no gain person. You really need to just like rest because that's going to help you go further. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Or you got to find a coach that'll force it. (laughs) Yes, yes, yes. I will just slap you and be like, what are you doing? Right. Um, So what about supplementation? Did you use any supplements to help you recover through all this volume or? Oh, right, right, right. Um, during most of my career, I was with MHP. So I, I took a lot of their glutamine, their active. I've never been a huge supplement person. Probably all the only thing I messed with is glutamine, uh, glucosamine, um, BCAAs, and then fish oil. It's like the standard uh, recovery. Now, huh? I said, so like the standard recovery type. Yeah, standard recovery stuff. I am a huge like Epsom salt hot bath girl. I got a lot of massages, stretched a lot. So nowadays I probably do at least 20 minutes of stretching a day and it's really helped my mobility like to a, a fold. But yeah, back then, I mean, just just your basics. Yeah. Uh, muscle rebuilder, yeah. Do you ever float? You ever do the float tank? No, but that seems cool. Oh, okay, yeah. It's been like a staple in my recovery lately. Yeah. Is that uh, where you go float for like an hour? Yeah, so it's um what they do is they fill this water up with it's Epsom salt. So you get like a lot of the recovery benefits from it. And uh they fill it up so that the viscosity is is such that you're completely neutrally buoyant in the water. And then you close the top so you get that sensory deprivation so it's like black in there. So you literally are feeling nothing. Um not only are you getting like the Epsom salt, but it's like forced meditation and then you're also completely free from any load so even when you sleep right you're like loading your joints in a certain way and it's like the only time you're completely deloaded so after pretty much every um ultra or super long event that i do i always i always book a float like the next day wow i need to do that i saw that they have one here in austin now and groupon was sending little coupons out for it and i now with you talking about it now i'm just like how oh, i just i would love to just be in nothing for a while yeah literally i mean it's a game changer i it feels like it speeds up my recovery by like a few days honestly oh i'm sure the hardest part is the mind part of it so like the mental part so the first 20 minutes you're like going crazy like get me the hell out of here but then you kind of get into a groove and yeah 
you start. I don't know. It's pretty good. I James Newberry, CrossFit Games athlete. We have him coming on the show, and he actually, before every single workout he did for the CrossFit Open, would float and visualize every single rep throughout the whole wow. workout. Wow. He's yeah. Okay, so that's cool that you brought that up. So when I used to race, I used to every, I used to dream of me winning. I literally would envision it all the time, and sure enough, I pretty much my dreams actually would come true. So what he did and what I used to do, even though I don't compete, like if you start envisioning yourself as successful, it you can make it happen. You yeah. Have to keep, yeah, you have to really believe it. Yeah. Yeah, I completely agree. I uh, the guy I had a guy I talked to that was the agent for Brett Favre, which is kind of random, but he um. <laughs> Yeah, but he uh, he talked to me a lot about like manifesting what you want to happen, and he just was like, "It sounds like I'm a quack, dude, but it's like the most powerful thing I've ever, I've ever done it in is. my life." Yeah. yeah, and I didn't even realize it at the time when I was doing. I just wanted to win. I wanted to be great, so I'd always just like constantly see it in my head. Mm-hmm. And sure enough, I made it happen. You know. Yeah. Do you do that now? The visual visualization techniques. Do you do that now with like your speaking and stuff? Yeah, um, so I just recently started speaking. Um, I've done a few conventions and events lately, and it's just amazing. I, I envision myself and how I want to impact people and how I want the experience to go. Now, I am try to like separate how much I want it to happen versus what really is going to happen. And I've been working on a lot of stuff, but I'm not going to really too much disclose it because I'm like on the grounds right now in production of creating my own brand and uh, business right now. So I've been spending a lot of time just like drawing and designing things, but um, I envision what I'm going to do, how I'm going to do it, and I'm just and I slowly make the steps to execute it. So I'm just researching everything and just keep envisioning it and keep learning and keep educating yourself, so you can constantly keep fulfilling that dream inside your head until it's like you're doing it. Right. Yeah. Two things. One, I nailed that transition into what you're doing now, and two, uh, what are you speaking about right now? Um, so basically, I speak a lot about my story and basically what my eating disorder taught me and how how that darkness can teach you how to become very aware of yourself and have self-love. So it just kind of is like what my double life brought to me and um, is in hopes to help bring inspiration to women and men uh, alike. Are you speaking to mostly fitness crowds, like at fitness conferences? So far, it's, so far I was at a fitness convention at FitCon and I spoke there. And just due to my background as a former professional athlete, people, that's a field that I'm very familiar in. So people have brought me out to that, but it's not, I don't plan on just staying in that realm for sure. Um, Right now it's an easy startup to just get invited. And I think I'll be, I think I I just got invited to speak at a bodybuilding show, which is pretty cool on like in October. So like, yes, I'll, I'll keep doing that, but eventually I'll probably branch off and do a little bit more. Mm -hmm. outside of fitness yeah sure i think that's actually a really cool forum for your message particularly because it's such a subjective sport that there's probably a lot of people that could use your message a hundred percent yeah yeah and i just really want to help people um i don't want anyone to feel how i felt back then like and be scared of like admitting that they need help that was a huge step for me was like wow i i can't do this alone and that's okay You, you it's okay to have help um, so I just like I just want to take people's pain away. Like I'm a huge healer, and that's all I really want to do. And I feel like that's my true purpose in life now. Yeah, and and something I think is really important is the fact that you're going after this new thing that you want. Sometimes when you start a new endeavor, or you pivot and you go a new direction. It can be really difficult uh, because at first you don't feel like you have the momentum that you had previously. But you like literally never know who you're inspiring. And who's like, who's getting something from your message. So I think if you have a message like you do, it's super important to get it out there because you can't always quantify the uh, impact of that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, how do you stay motivated now? Like, so we got past the, like, using, like, the, the difficult times as motivation. So with your businesses and your speaking and the things you're doing now, like, how, how are you staying motivated? Or what, what is it that pushes you to get up? A lot of the times it's just, like, I know this might sound cheesy, but it's a lot of the people who reach out to me because when I was competing, if I had someone, not that I'm like this whole mighty person that hung the moon, but if I had someone who was just real about stuff, who, you know, showed 
the ups and downs and yet was successful and fell on their face and didn't fall on their face once or twice. They fell hard and lost contracts and, you know, quit a really cool lifestyle so they could get better. I mm. wish I had that some type of guidance and, and draw strength from. So a lot of the times I give and I give a lot to people and I can feel quite empty, but the more I give to people and the people respond and I can see that they are grateful and they're changing and they want to be healthier. It actually fills me back up. Mm. So me helping people helps me. It helps me come to terms with what I've gone through. And every time I speak about my story, I feel like I learn something more about myself. So the more I just keep opening up, and I don't know how many times I've told my stories. It's been a million times, right? Mm -hmm. But I constantly learn because I get to you know, converse with people and they get to tell me their stories. And I'm like, wow, you know, what you just told me resonates with me as well. So it really just helps me learn and helps me be, be, a, be a better person. And that's actually really powerful because I think there's a lot of people that are living a lifestyle that doesn't align with them uh, because of the lifestyle it pr provides, right? Yeah. They're living a life that they, they don't want. And, and they weren't, they're not even pro athletes. Like most of them are just have a good paycheck or whatever for their nine to five. Mm -hmm. um, so making that pivot is super, I think it's difficult. Yeah. yeah. And do you think it was like the rock bottom type experience that made you make that pivot? Yes, but I don't think I registered that until maybe about a year and a half ago. When you could um, kind of reflect on it? Yeah, like I used to pride myself a lot in being very independent and so strong. And like I was able to do anything and overcome anything because I also, I mean, I did overcome not walking for quite some time as a young girl. So in my head, I just thought I had to be strong and I couldn't show weakness. And I was also just a huge perfectionist. So me letting that side of that go was really hard because I realized that there was also like the superior and inferior version of myself and I teeter all the time. And if I actually just look at both of them, they're the same, they're the same girl. I can't be who I am without having some type of perfection and some type of flaw. So I, I better start appreciating it. So that's when I started realizing, okay, like the darkness, what did I learn from this? Okay, I learned like how to find triggers. I learned that this is not how I want to be. So how can I change that in better ways? How can I bring that to other people? Um, because that also lifts me up more. Um, so yeah, it was a lot of just like realizing what I had gone through and just wanting to be happy because I was miserable. Hmm. And it's not fun being miserable and hating yourself. Like you have to just find that strength and courage to just love yourself no matter what where you're at because you are an artist and you can mold yourself I mean it takes time and it takes years but you can change you can change your life you can change your head you know yeah for sure no I completely agree all right so the Lionheart kicker is the final question this is a good segue into it I think if you could give advice and it were guaranteed that everybody in the world would hear it and it would be translated to every language uh, based on the experiences that you've had and the, and the things that you've done this far, what would you tell people? To be present in every single moment and to be grateful for whatever you're encountering. Um, like I said, with the darkness, you need to be there. For your happy days, you need to be there. You can't get lost in that and you need to become the fly on the wall instead of the star in your own life. So you can see everything going on and not be lost in it. Hmm. Yeah. Make yeah. It, no, it definitely does. Being present is extremely hard, especially if you're a motivated person, right? Like um, yeah. I'm always looking to the next project and I'm like, Oh, just once I get here and it's like, you fall into that mentality of once I have this, I'll be happy. And it's such a yes. shitty way to live your life. Yes. I had a harsh like slap to the face. It was yesterday. I had like a, an emotional day just because my own head depleted my energy. I just got really like eager with this project I'm working on and then finances and all this and that. And I just suddenly was like, oh, this is stressful. And so like I had myself like a little cry and I was like, okay, like, and most of the time I feel like, especially with women and I, I, even men, I, especially men, actually, we often feel very upset when we have emotion like that, especially when it feels like it comes out of nowhere. But I've been very stressed out internally. So it was like, okay, me beating myself up for just crying is so silly. So that's why I was like, okay, I'll just be present and I'll let these emotions come out rather than feeling like, oh, why are you crying over something so silly or blah, 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 blah. Like we're human. We're, we're made to have emotions. Yeah. Yeah, motivated people have to learn to give themselves a break for sure. Oh, yeah. And that's, I mean, I'm constantly having to 
relearn that. Um, I'm not the best. I would never say someone can master that. Um, but yeah, you have to slowly learn how to rest. <laughs> yeah. So for people that are inspired by your journey and they want to support you and what you're doing and, um, and maybe even check out some of the content that you've put out, how can they do that? I'm very active on my Instagram, which is at Ella Kasiba. And I'm sure you can be able to spell that out because my last name is a little weird. Twitter, I'm on Twitter as well. It's still my name, Ella Kasiba. Facebook is Ella Ann Kasiba. I'm not as active on Facebook, but if you follow my Instagram and Twitter, I'll be constantly updating. And all my like business and stuff that will be coming off in the next few months will be posted on there as well. Perfect. And then um, we'll link all of that up uh, as well as your book in the show notes of this episode. So, Yeah, which is uh, the book is on Amazon. Perfect. All right. So uh, thanks for being on today. I really appreciate taking Yay. the time again. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Perfect. Woo. Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening to Lionheart Radio. I hope that the information from today's show will make you fitter, happier, and healthier. For the show notes of this episode and every episode, head to www.lionheartrad.io. Yep, just like Lionheart Radio. And please, if you have the time, head over to iTunes and give us a five-star rating. It really helps us to know that we're on the right track and delivering you reliable information and value. As always, feedback is welcome. If you have any comments on the show or like to suggest a guest, send me an email at rick at louaviv.com. That's L-U-A-V-I-V-E. Dot com. Thanks for your support, yeah. and we will see you next time. Bitch, I feel good. Don't I look stupendous? My shine is so endless, and shit you can do to end this. Even when I'm dead, niggas still gon' bump that chip shit. Coke, white, escalate on cinches for you dipshit. So you won't forget this. Midwest, nigga, be the coldest. People in-